Hi everyone, welcome back. In this lecture we're going to focus on taking all the techniques we've learned so far to find antiderivatives, such as the substitution rule, uh, integration by parts, uh, specifically looking at trigonometric functions and using identities to rewrite the integrand in order to find antiderivatives. We're going to look at all of these methods all at once now and we may find that in some problems we're going to have to apply a couple of methods in sequence to figure out what the result is. So we're all, this section is all about just doing a lot of different problems, a lot of different antiderivatives. So let's have a, a look. I've included here a table of uh, all the basic antiderivatives that you are expected to know and we're going to be pulling information from this ta table as we need it as we go along but you should definitely know the antiderivatives in this table in order to make progress with the ones to come. So let's have a look at some examples. This first one, part A, maybe we should just take a moment to maybe discuss what kind of technique would be our first thought in attacking these problems. And keep in mind that whenever you see a problem, you certainly have the ability to pause the video, work on it on your own for a little bit, and then maybe restart the video and see how I ended up doing it and make comparisons with how you did it and I did it. So if you want to take a crack at these now, pause the video and have a crack at them. Okay, so we're going to get started with these ones. The antiderivative of x plus 4 over x cubed plus x. Well, it's a rational function. The top is not the straight derivative of the bottom, so it doesn't look like substitution is going to work directly. So maybe I should apply partial fractions in this case. So that's sort of my first knee-jerk reaction. Is uh, This looks like a partial fractions problem. So let's see if we can go to work on that then. So in order to do partial fraction decomposition, we've got to take our original integrand, which I will write in this way, and decompose it. We decompose it into a sum where we take each of the irreducible pieces in the denominator and put them in new denominators of this sum. And if we've got a linear piece on the bottom, we add a constant on top, which we're going to try to have to figure out. If we've got this quadratic piece, then at worst there's going to be a linear piece on top. Now the question is, what are a, b, and c in order to get this decomposition? Well, we can clear denominators by multiplying both sides by the x times x squared plus 1, so that gives us x plus 4, and then the x times x squared plus 1 times a, the x's will cancel. And we get an a times x squared plus 1, and then the other piece would be a b times bx plus c. So I've cleared denominators. Whatever a, b, and c have to be to satisfy this, they have to be the same a, b, and c, a, b, and c that satisfy this expression. What can we do at this stage? Well, there's a couple options here. We can, we can expand both sides. Maybe we'll do that. x plus 4 ax squared, bx squared, so that's an a plus b times the x squared term. What's the x term coming from on this side? Well, there's a cx, so that's a cx. And what's the constant? The constant is just the a. So we've got that x plus 4 has to be this expression, and that tells us then what the coefficients have to be. So by comparing coefficients, we see that a plus b has to be 0, c has to be 1, and a has to be 4. Well, if a is 4, then b has to be negative 4. And so we've ended up finding our values of a, b, and c. So our original integral, which is x plus 4 all over x times x squared plus 1 dx, the integrand can be rewritten using this partial fraction decomposition. And so that's 4 over x plus negative 4x plus 1 all over x squared plus 1 dx. And now we can go to work on this. Well, what the, the first one I can just get as a natural logarithm. The second one, well, it might be best to split it up. So we'll write out the first one. The second one, we can write that as a negative 4 over x squared plus 1, plus a 1 over, oh, I missed the x there, 4x over x squared plus 1. 
and a 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Why have I split it up? Well, now we can see that that last term, 1 over x squared plus 1, the antiderivative of that is arctan. And the previous one, we can get the antiderivative of that by using a substitution. So this was 4 natural log of x minus, and to get the antiderivative of this, we could use a substitution. You might be able to just write it down if you've done these enough. So the antiderivative should be a logarithm of x squared plus 1 with some coefficient out front. What's the coefficient? Well, when I take the derivative of this, a 2x is going to come out from the derivative of the inside. I need a 4x, so I just add an extra 2 out front. So there's our antiderivative of the, of the second term. The third term, the antiderivative, is arctan of x, and we have our constant of integration c. So there's the solution to the first antiderivative. Let's have a look at the next one. It's part b. The integral from 0 to pi by 2 of sine to the fourth x cos cubed x dx. So what do we do here? Well, I've got cosine to an odd power. If I borrow one of those cosines, so split it away from the other ones, then I'd have a cos squared with another cosine left over. That cos squared I could rewrite in terms of sine. And then I've got a bunch of other stuff in terms of sine. So if I substitute for the sine function, the derivative would be the cosine function, that one that I split off from the rest. So I could use that in a substitution. So it looks like this is going to be able to be solved using a substitution. u equals sine of x. So let's first see how we rewrite the expression in order to make use of the substitution. So I was going to keep the four signs. I was going to borrow another two cosines from here, so a cos squared, and the cos squared I could rewrite as a 1 minus sine squared x. And that uses up two of those cosines, and then I have one of them left over. And so the substitution that we're going to do is going to be u is sine of x, so that would replace all of these signs, and then that cosine that I peeled away from the other ones joins together with the dx to allow me to make that substitution. So we can also switch the limits. This is a definite integral, so we'll switch the limits as well. When x is pi by 2, u is equal to sine of pi by 2, which is 1. When x is 0, u is equal to sine of 0, which is 0. So our new limits of integration become from 0 to 1. Sine gets replaced with u. That's a 1 minus u squared. And the cos dx gets replaced with the du. So after a substitution, we've now reduced this to an integral of a polynomial. So we can expand this out. That's u to the 4th minus u to the 6th du. And now we can anti-differentiate. That's a 1 fifth u to the 5th minus a 1 7th u to the 7th from 0 to 1, or in other words, 1 fifth minus 1 seventh, which is uh, 1 fifth is uh, 7 30 fifths minus 5 30 fifths, so the result is 2 30 fifths. How about the next one? What is it? e to the x sine 2x dx. So we're looking at the antiderivative of e to the x sine 2x dx. What can we do with this one? Well, we've seen a similar one to this when we were working in by parts, uh, the method of by parts. If we do a by parts on this twice, so we do two applications of by parts, we're able to cycle around and get back to the original integral and then use some algebra to solve. So let's refresh our memory with how we did that. By parts, I take u to be part of it and dv to be another part. What do I want to take u to be? What do I want to take dv to be? I could take uh, u to be sine 2x and dv to be e to the x dx. So du is 2 cosine 2x 
dx, and v is e to the x. So our integral under one application and by parts is equivalent to e to the x sine 2x minus the antiderivative of the v du part. So that's e to the x. There's a 2 there, so I can pull that out front. Cos 2x dx. Now at this stage, um, just a quick check. Did we make any progress? Well, we started with an integrand that had an x, e to the x, an exponential, and a trig function. We've reduced it to another integral involving an exponential and a trig function, the cosine in this case. If we do it again, an application by parts again, that cosine should switch back to a sine function. And then that's the original integral we started with. So at that point, we can use algebra. So we will do a by parts application again. We're going to take u to be the cosine 2x and dv to be e to the x dx again. So du is going to be negative 2 sine 2x dx and v is e to the x. So our original integral is equal to e to the x sine 2x minus 2 times and so the new integral that we found, we're going to write down what it is equivalent to in terms of an appli using the application by parts. So this is e to the x cos 2x, so that's the vu, minus the product of v du. There's already a minus 2 in the du part, so I'll make that a plus 2 times the integral of e to the x um, sine, of x, sine of 2x dx. And now at this stage, we've got an equation involving the integral that we're trying to find. So that's the integral I'm interested in finding the value of. And now we can solve it using al this equation using algebra. So we'll solve for the thing in the red box. So it's the integral of e to the x sine 2x dx. We had two of them, negative four of them on this side. This this thing would multiply into both of those. So I have negative four of them over here, one of them over here. So when I move the one on the right over to the left, I get five of them is equal to e to the x sine 2x minus 2e to the x cos 2x. And now I can divide both sides by five. And I get a one-fifth e to the x sine 2x minus a 2 fifths e to the x cos 2x. And we have our plus an arbitrary constant on the end. And so there's our result.